Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, workshop of the Mental Health for Activists. We're very pleased to have you uh, join us tonight. Uh, before I turn the mic over to our presenters this evening, let me bring your attention to some upcoming activities. On November 24th, we will have uh, at 11, that uh, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern, we will have a book talk on historical materialism. That is Sunday, November 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's working class, the working class think tank on historical materialism. Then on December 16th, the Mental Health for Activists workshop will do a book talk on alienation by Bertal Ullman. That's December 16th, Monday, December 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Book talk on alienation by Bertal Ullman. Lastly, we would like you to mark your calendars January 18th through February 15th. We will do a multi-series of classes. Um, we will conduct a national Marxist online school from January 18th through uh, February 15th. So please mark your calendar and plan to attend. So uh, without any more delay, I will turn the mic over to our first presenter this evening, Jim. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So this has been uh, quite a few weeks for all of us. And so one of the things we wanted to talk about is dealing with anxiety and depression, which are pretty rampant right now in our country, um, particularly following the election results. And there are a couple of things I wanted to talk about with respect to that. One is to start off by saying that anxiety and fear are normal human emotions. They are what protected our ancestors when the saber-toothed tiger came around that they would know, like I, you know, I really need to know whether I can fight this animal or whether I have to run from this animal. Um, our, our stress response is rooted in our biology and we share it to a large degree with other mammals. We share it to some degree with reptiles and less um, evolved um, creatures and they have been part of our survival. One of the issues though with our stress response, particularly for human beings, is that while it can be helpful for our survival and it can be helpful in informing us about how to respond to certain situations, it can also be debilitating and actually can be bad for our health, both our mental health and our physical health. And so one of the things we all, you know, it's, it's useful, I think, for all of us to think about is given a situation that clearly, I, I think probably nobody on this, um, in this class had hoped would be the result. And many of us worked very hard to avoid. Um, and there's certainly a lot of um, analysis that needs to be done about how we got here and what to do as a movement. Um, we also need to think about how to take care of ourselves and very related to that, how to take care of each other. Because we are, as a species, um, you know, we all talk about this. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about that we're a social animal. We are a social species. We are born to be part of collectives. And this is something that class divided society and particularly neoliberal capitalism works against, which is something I, I wanna talk about with respect to this because isolation, um, one of the things I, I've seen several scientific studies that show that 
Um, a lot of the studies have been done with people who are elderly and isolated, but I think they um, carry over to the rest of us that isolation in terms of even a person's physical health, isolation and loneliness can be as um, damaging to a person's health as smoking, as heavy drinking, as um, a lot of other unhealthy life habits. We are not, um, th this is not our biology to live like that. And one of the things, you know, as we think about how do we cope with this situation and how do we cope with it in a way that we not only are healthy and that we're able to survive, but how do we cope with it in a way that we need to as working class um, activists, revolutionaries, people who need to be on the front lines of the fight back in this situation. Um, we don't want to just survive. We want to be able to be there and be there as fully as we can. And so I would say, you know, the first thing that we all need is to make sure that we are part of supportive and active collectives in our lives um, who can help us, number one, carry the, you know, and, and, and affirm for each other that we are having some of these feelings. We can't just pretend we don't. You can't legislate that if you have a feeling, um, you, you just pretending that you don't have it can in many ways be harmful um, in and of itself, but that we need to be able to have connection. And one of the things that we, that we see the fascist movement and the neoliberal capitalist society do is to try to atomize us all to get us all living in our own little bubbles, in our own house, looking at our own little screen, um, you know, seeking out sometimes precisely um, emotional reactions that are not actually helpful for us. And so one of the things is that we all do need to make sure that we are connected, that we are connected with people who will be supportive to us that we can be supportive to other people because it's it's a um it's it's something that needs to go both ways um it it's important that we recognize that while fear which is basically the recognition of danger is a helpful emotion on some level that panic is not if you think about if you're in a house that's on fire or you are in a situation where you're either facing a predatory person or a predatory group of people, it is useful to be aware that this is a dangerous situation. I need to cope with it in some way. I need to have a plan and I need to be as clear as I can be and as, um, as rational as I can be, recognizing that I'm having this feeling so that I don't become paralyzed and so that I don't become overreactive to the situation, because that's a lot of times what causes people in dangerous situations not to be able to respond in a way that is helpful either to their mental health or their physical health, but also that's not helpful in terms of um, facing down either an enemy or a disaster or whatever the person may be facing. So one of the things is, I, I want to underline if I if nothing else I say um, stay sticks with anybody. Um, if you are a Communist Party member, if you are a member of a club, be sure that you participate, that um, you are supportive to your fellow club members. If you are a member of a union, that you are supportive to your fellow um, siblings in the union and whatever what other other movements you may belong to, and that you seek out other people's support, that you not pretend to be the one hero who never loses their head. Because one of the things about a collective that's really helpful and that's really important is that sometimes there may be things that push my buttons that don't push your buttons in the same way. Or there may be things that push your buttons that don't push my buttons in the same way. And in a collective, it's not incumbent on any one person to always be 
good at everything or always be strong or not be frightened in any particular moment, we get to take turns and we get to be supportive of each other to make sure that we're able to at least express ourselves, to be honest about what our feelings are, and and even to get the feedback from other people if we feel like we're out of control or it seems to other people that we may be um, panicking or we may be so caught up in outrage constantly that it's not good for us, it's not good for our health, and it may not be good for the group of people that we are participating with, that we are working with. So, you know, I think that's that's an important piece. Reactivity is something we, I think, all need to be very cognizant of. Um, one of the techniques that the MAGA Trump movement has used, not out of keeping with historical fascist and fascist-like movements, is that um, it is deliberately provocative and it deliberately tries to draw people into a type of reactivity that in many ways draws off their energy and makes it difficult to actually do anything about anything. I can remember the last time Trump was president that periodically he would do things or his administration would do things whose very purpose to me seemed to be to get everybody on Facebook basically screaming in a, in a printed form or in a angry face form or whatever, um, so that people were unable to, to w when you're constantly being traumatized over and over and over again, it's hard to think clearly. It's hard to get connected to people because the feeling that perhaps you either just wanna scream or you wanna write rants on Facebook or you want to hide under the bed or you wanna, um, I don't know, get a bottle of whiskey or whatever, it, it, those are responses people have. They're not um, spontaneous. The, there is an intention behind this kind of constant re-traumatization. Um, I want to recommend, if anyone's ever read, uh, has not read the book, The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein, one of the things she talks about is how um, what she called disaster capitalism relies upon a public and a people being thrown so completely um, and shocked so completely that the ruling class is able to put through um, legislation, to put through reorganization and privatization, and to make its, um, to make its uh, agenda manageable while people are disoriented. This is what interrogators do in torture situations. It's what prison officials do often, putting people into solitary, getting people confused about time and space and place, keeping people isolated, keeping people constantly on edge. And so one of the things that is a tricky, I find it tricky, um, balance is to figure out how do I stay informed? How do we um, know what's happening, be clear about what's happening in a timely way, be able to participate in our various organizations in a way that is constructive, and at the same time, not be constantly addicted to looking at every single um, hateful, misogynistic, horrible thing that Donald Trump or Stephen Miller or any of the rest of that group say every time they open their mouths. And social media is, is helpful in that it allows us to get news quickly. But it's important, I think, that we limit how much and how often we constantly keep looking for reinforcement of that kind of feeling of constant outrage, constant desire to um, rail in our own heads, at least, against something that we be conscious of the sources of information that we seek out that we not seek out information 
constantly from places that are seeking that sort of, I, mean, I don't know how many of you have watched, Fox News really got into it, the Fox News alert thing. But CNN has kind of caught, followed suit. MSNBC has followed suit. This sort of thing to keep you watching so that you'll keep watching the commercials. Um, I find it useful myself that I will, I will often listen to the five-minute NPR news, which, you know, you have to keep, be sure about how, how accurate you think things are. I will sometimes watch a little CNN, maybe a little MSNBC. I read the People's World regularly. I speak Spanish, so I actually watch Cuban TV online. I watch Telesur online, which actually has an English version. I watch um, the Chinese Global Television Network online, not because you don't see the coverage of horrible things that are happening and the important things that we need to know, but that there's a difference I find between seeing um, news that I may not want to hear and being maybe outraged about it, but at the same time, not having to be outraged about how it's being covered. And so I, I, I'm certainly not arguing that we should stick our heads in the sand and not see what the bourgeois press covers and how it covers it, but that we not confine ourselves to that and that we be um, just cognizant of how much time we spend watching and listening to what and how much time we spend um, responding with our comrades, with our friends, with our siblings in the struggle um, and figuring out what to do. And I think that's what I want to conclude with is that um, one of the things that has been pretty clear from the study of post-traumatic stress disorder is not everyone who experiences a traumatic situation experiences PTSD, even combat, even combat, um, physical combat, war. What seems to be one of the main um, factors that leads to a post-traumatic reaction is a feeling of impotence and helplessness in a traumatic situation. That what often happens then is the human brain, in order to self-protect, shuts itself down to some degree. The person may not even be able to remember the trauma that happened. Um, but then at the same time, the brain will replay the trauma over and over and over and over again, seeking some sort of control over the situation. It's important when we look at it that way that we realize that what the what the fascist movement, what the MAGA movement, what what the ruling class generally, but particularly this noxious version um, of ruling class rule. Um, I wish I could think of a better way to say that. Um, but of the of the particular type of um, what we are facing um, in terms of its rule is that its purpose is to make us feel helpless, to leave us feeling isolated, to make us feel so overwhelmed that we can't respond. And so, you know, one of the things really is, I think, when you see something happening, to be able to be part of a collective to ask yourself and for the collective to ask itself, what can we do about this at this particular point? We may not have power over the whole situation, but what do we have power over? And what can we use that power for collectively? Because as we respond to these kinds of situations with some collective power, and God knows, even during the last Trump administration, we were able to push back a number of the worst excesses, not all of them, but a lot, a number of the worst things that that administration did. Um, the more we can ask ourselves, okay, I'm feeling fearful right now, I'm feeling out outraged right now, I'm feeling angry right now, and so what can I do with that outrage? What can I do right now rather than just sitting here and feeling helpless, feeling outraged, talking to other people and just reinforcing for each other how horrible it is, how terrible it is, why can't we do anything about this? This is a place where I think Ho Chi Minh one time was quoted as saying, turn your outrage into action. Turn your pain 
into power. And, and you know, this isn't a simple thing to do, but I think it's a way to, to think about it in terms of when I'm having these feelings, what can I do with the energy that's being generated by my anger or even by my fear? What can I do with the energy? And what, more importantly, what can we do with it? And, and I think if we, the more we can do things, act together, build solidarity, and actually have an effect on the situation, and the less we spend time just listening to the endless talking heads, telling things to us that are, are meant to make us feel powerless and meant to just make us feel an endless kind of outrage, um, the better off we're going to be rather than sitting with that energy to take that energy and act on it together. In the end, it's not only better for the world, it's also better for our individual mental health and our collective mental health. And that's, that's something for those of you who may not be members of the Communist Party or of a union or of an organization near you, I really urge you. Um, we'd love to have you in the Communist Party if that seems like the right place for you. But that that kind of action to join with others to say, yes, I'm angry. Yes, I'm afraid. Yes, whatever it is that I may feel. But as Che Guevara said, if you tremble with outrage at every injustice, you are a comrade of mine. And we should take that energy into comradeship, into solidarity, and into action. Thank you, Jim. We will now turn the mic over to Richard. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Richard again. Today, I'm going to be speaking about sleep hygiene and mindfulness as skills for um, our mental health and also in terms of just helping us manage our emotional reactivity. Um, so when we think about sleep, everybody knows it's good for you. Um, but there are lots of negatives to having insufficient sleep. Um, there are physical effects that um, I'm not going to get into today, uh, but there is definite change in your cognitive faculties. So your attention span is going to be lower. Uh, you're going to have a more difficult time with critical thinking and reasoning. And if you think about what those two things do, is it makes it more difficult to respond to stress. And if you're having a hard time responding to stress, you can freeze up or you can conversely get into a situation where you are acting um, with a lot of emotional reactivity. And I think anybody who's been really tired knows um, it's just a fact of life. So what are some things that we can do to improve our sleep? Um, sleep hygiene is a searchable term where you can get lots of worksheets. Um, the health system in the UK has some free ones that if anyone's having difficulty with insomnia um, or has been finding themselves like scrolling through their phone late at night lately, um, I would encourage you to, to search for those free worksheets. Um, they've got blogs that you can do and kind of see what type of improvement you're making. Uh, but here are some highlights for things that you can pay attention to to try to correct your sleep. Uh, first is being mindful about substances. That includes coffee. Uh, so try to make sure you're not drinking coffee um, any more than like eight hours to bedtime. Um, alcohol, people will often drink trying to fall asleep. And while that might be effective in the short term, it actually prevents you from getting quality sleep, and you actually might wake up throughout the night because of it. Uh, similar things with marijuana. Uh, it, it's legal, at least here in Illinois, and it can help somebody fall asleep, but it tends to prevent you from getting good quality sleep. So even though you might be asleep for a period of time that you'd like to, um, you might end up waking up uh, without, well, without being well rested. Um, Try to limit some activities to where, uh, limit the activities of what you're doing in bed to just sleeping and sex. Uh, so if you can put down your phone, keep your computer out of there. Um, ideally, um, 
you'd really be doing nothing in bed other than those two activities. Um, another thing, and this is a little bit more difficult with shift work, but uh, if you're able to establish a routine, it's important that you do and stick with it. So while it's tempting to sleep in on the weekends or on days off, what you're doing is you're kind of tricking yourself into thinking that you don't need to go to sleep at the same time that you need to. And being consistent with it is going to be better for you in the long run. Um, if you are finding yourself waking up at night and being concerned about how much time you have to left and checking the clock, what you're doing is making yourself anxious by thinking about it. And more than likely, you're going to make it more difficult to fall asleep. So if you have an alarm set, trust that the alarm's working and try to sleep through it. And not, not to try to sleep through the alarm, but try to sleep through the night. Just close your eyes. Uh, another thing is, it's, it, while it's tempting to nap, it's generally not recommended to do so. And then uh, kind of on the same, you know, same vein as thinking about our sleep, I want to talk about progressive muscle relaxation. So this is a skill that's useful for um, falling asleep if you have insomnia. It's one of the, the few non um, non-pharmacological interventions that's been proven to work, uh, but it's also helpful for reducing stress and anxiety in other situations. Um, so I think we have enough time to do it quickly, uh, but when you want to try this on your own, I would encourage you to take your time with it. So what I want everybody to, to do if you're in a situation where you're able to is get in a comfortable position and just start to pay attention to what's going on with yourself. Notice your emotions, what your thoughts are, and what you're feeling in your body. Are you noticing any aches and pains, tense areas? And what we're gonna do is start at the top of our head and work our way down uh, in different muscle groups. And what is I want you to do is try to stress those muscles and tense them up. And as you're releasing, pay attention to what it feels like to release those muscles. Because if somebody tells you to relax, you don't know how to relax, but we do know how to tense. And once you're tense, you know how to release that tense. And what you're trying to do here is just kind of get everything as loose as you can get it. Um, so starting with your face, just kind of clench up your face and mess it up. You know, I'm gonna make a silly face and just hold it for a second and slowly release. And notice what it feels like to release that tension, what it feels like in your forehead and your eyes and um, jaw and neck. And then, if again, if you have time, I would encourage you to do this a few times um, just as you're getting used to it. The next part, we're going to go down to our shoulders and try to touch your ears with your shoulders. And then slowly relax and notice what it feels like the tension to come out of your shoulders and see if you can relax it even further. The shoulders and the jaw are places where people often carry stress. So if this is something you're finding effective now, um, it's something that you can really do wherever, as long as you don't mind what it looks like. Um, the next part is to just kind of clench up your, your fists and your arms and just kind of notice what that feels like and really pay attention to what it feels like to release it and try to get it as relaxed as possible. And then you go down to your torso and try to flex your chest and upper back. You might wanna, and you can also include like your, your abdomen with this and kind of get like a turtle making a hard shell, tense it up and then notice what it feels like to relax all of those muscles. Then you're working your way down to your legs, try to get your upper legs and your butt, get them tense, and slowly relax and feel what it feels like to make those muscles soft. Go down to your calves and your feet, try to curl your feet, tense your calves, slowly release, and notice how it feels to release. Then after you go through that, you might notice some changes. So I want you to then go ahead and think about those same questions that I asked at the beginning. What are your emotions? 
what are you thinking? What is your, where are you feeling in your body? Where are you still feeling tension? And this is something that if you're doing it lying down, um, again, can be really helpful for sleep. It typically takes a couple of nights of practice before it starts to be really effective. Um, and if it's helpful to have somebody walking you through it, there are plenty of free videos on YouTube about it. All right, so then um, I want to return to the mindfulness skill. So we've talked about mindfulness here in the past, um, but thinking about reactivity and thinking about uh, anxiety and depression, this is a really useful skill to, to practice. Um, so the example that I, I kind of want to bring up to make you think about this concept is don't think about a pink elephant. If that's your instruction and that's what you're trying to do, you're going to be thinking about a pink elephant. That's just how the brain works. Um, and similarly, if you think about rumination, and rumination is where you are thinking about a bad thing over and over and over again. You're trying not to think about the bad thing. You had an embarrassing memory from 12 years ago that came up. You're trying not to think about it, and all you're doing is thinking about it. You're thinking about some of the terrible things happening in the world right now. You're trying not to think about it. You open up your phone to not think about it. You're looking at the news and thinking about it. That's rumination. It's trying to not think about the pink elephant. So mindfulness is the practice of non-judgmentally observing your emotions, your thoughts, and your world. And it's a way of kind of trying to notice that things are happening. And while you're not necessarily accepting that it's happening or accepting that it's a good thing, you're just noticing that it's happening and choosing what you're focusing on. So rather than thinking, I don't want to think about the pink elephant, and then thinking about the pink elephant, you would be doing something like saying, I'm thinking about a pink elephant, and I will return my attention to the presentation that I'm giving. Or um, really, it, that that's, that's the crux of it. So. A way to practice mindfulness is just to pick something to focus on and to notice what's happening while you're focusing on it. Because our mind is constantly wandering. Well, maybe not everybody's. At least my mind is constantly wandering. So an exercise you might try is brushing your teeth. You can notice what it feels like to brush in circular motions or back and forth. You can pay attention to the taste of the toothpaste, um, the way that the mentholated stuff feels in the back of your throat, um, the saliva production. There are all sorts of things that you can pay attention to. And as you're brushing your teeth, you're just really trying to focus your attention there while also being open to whatever else is going on. So you might be brushing your teeth and then you think about I'm running late for work. I'm running late for work. I'm going to keep brushing my teeth and focus on this right now. Um, and it, it's really, it, it's as simple as that and is, it's incredibly difficult. So it, I would encourage you, if this is something that sounds interesting, to try practicing it for two or three minutes at a time initially and then work your way up. And it's something that eventually, with enough practice, you can notice unpleasant emotional states, unpleasant thoughts, state what they are, and direct your attention on something else. So um, with that concludes my section of the presentation. Thank you, Richard. And now we'll turn the mic over to our last presenter, Diana. OK. So I am going to be talking about just some skills, um, some different techniques. I'll be honest, this when I started thinking about this presentation, this was before November, so I had sort of a different feel to it. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it as brief and, and as useful as I possibly can. Um, 
So the first exercise that I kind of wanted to talk about is something called a vagus nerve reset. It comes from polyvagal theory. It doesn't matter. It Basically, the vagus nerve controls a lot of the functions in our body. It's super important in fight or flight, in feeling stress and feeling relaxation. And so this exercise should be done sitting down, okay? Um, and I'm going to demonstrate. Basically, you should have your hands behind your head. It's not a necessity, but you can't move your head, okay? You're going to be keeping your head straight, breathing normally. And essentially, you are going to move your eyes to the right as far as you can. And at least 30 seconds, continue blinking, breathing, everything is normal. You're going to look as far as you can. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, maybe a little bit painful. Um, do that for at least 30 seconds. Then you're going to move your eyes back to the center. And then do the same thing to the left side again. And then move to the center and then you can kind of relax and you'll know that it's working if you feel your like heart rate going down if you start to feel like you're gonna yawn um if you feel maybe less anxious um this kind of you know um is a little weird i know it can be a little bit uncomfortable and that's okay um the the thing that I want you to be aware of is that sometimes it can make you a little bit dizzy because you are kind of like staring like past the periphery almost and just make sure you're sitting down and taking some time to breathe but you know um you can try it out and see if it works for you the other way that you can kind of ground yourself is there's a spot like uh, if you can see it like right here um and basically it's kind of like a tender spot you can Take some breaths, have your feet grounded on the floor, you know, sit up straight as much as you can and just massage it for a few seconds. It'll feel a little bit tender as you breathe. And that should help you kind of slow down your breathing, your heart rate, and again, help you sort of regulate. Um, the other techniques that I, I've talked about and that I recommend um, is something called 54321. Um, it's five things you see, four things you hear, three things that you feel, two things you, that you smell, and one thing that you taste. I found that for some people, um, and I am some people, that it can be overwhelming. Like, you're, what are these senses? How many things am I looking for? Like, what? It's too much. So I've kind of thought about it as just focusing on like a list of categories that you can observe around you or a list of categories that you can think of. Um, if you have a favorite hobby, all of the things you need for that hobby. So just if you need to narrate and you need to sort of come out of a very stressful state, I find that that may be kind of useful. <clears throat> um, when it comes to breathing, I think that um, it can be really useful to pay attention to your breath. Um, and essentially, if you're experiencing a lot of anxiety, one way to kind of downregulate would be to do a one to two ratio of breath, meaning you inhale, let's say, for four and you exhale for eight. So the exhale has to be twice as long as the inhale. And a lot of times when people are hyperventilating, they are taking out like really short exhales and you wanna make that exhale long, okay? And for depression, sometimes what can help is keeping it even. So one thing that we've talked about before is box breathing. That's, you know, um, inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, you know, and hold for four, so even breaths. Four inhale, four exhale. Um, the other um, thing that I wanna talk, kind of show you guys and talk to you about is something called butterfly breath. Um, there's two ways to do it. It kind of depends on what is more comfortable. Um, the way that you are 
taught is to make like um like a butterfly with your hands and put it on your sternum and then just take slow breaths and and tap for some people that can be kind of uncomfortable and so like i prefer to put my hands on my shoulders and just take some breaths keep your eyes closed keep your eyes open um i find this part of it almost like imitates like like a weighted blanket um in the way that it helps you feel the weight of your own arms um and it sometimes helps you like feel safer in an environment which can be useful um and the other part of it is when you are super stressed and when you're experiencing a lot of emotions that sort of overtake your nervous system right you can't necessarily finish that stress cycle right and so you're still feeling really tense think about like an adrenaline rush where you're you're still your muscles are tense you're really upset like everything is still kind of going but you that interaction that that moment whatever it is that it's over but for whatever reason the stress cycle didn't finish in that way and so literally like shaking it out shaking your arms shaking your legs like dancing around moving your body moving the muscles like just so that you can kind of feel the release of that stress and it's something to pay attention to um because it could be a subtle change it might be a mood change it might be that you're not like t as tense you're not you know like sh as feeling as much stress and it could be a big shift or a small shift wow okay and another grounding technique that i kind of wanted to sh to share um and this can sort of be tailored to any way you, that makes sense for you and for your life okay so you're trying to shift your attention away from you as far as you possibly can towards as close as it possibly can feel meaning you're starting off like what do you see around you and that could be like naming categories or just naming objects or street signs or oh i'm in my office i'm in my bedroom i'm whatever right what do you hear um you know i hear the cars i hear this i hear this and it can be far away from you or you can what do you hear closer to you and then you start to sort of focus on what do you feel um and you're sort of starting furthest away from the center of your body so feet on the floor do you feel them do you feel your toes in your shoes can you wiggle them can you pay attention to that wiggling what does that feel like what what else do you feel um can you feel the seat underneath you if you're sitting down um do you feel the seat behind your back what does that feel like can you focus on that do you feel your clothes? Do you feel what you're wearing? Do you feel the shirt that's near you? Can you focus on that feeling or is it too uncomfortable? Do you feel the temperature on your skin? Are you cold? Are you hot? Are you sweating? Here's sort of the, the caveat with, with this. For some people, there will be a limit to how close inward it feels comfortable to pay attention. And if you get any closer, it will feel overwhelming and uncomfortable and triggering. And so I can't tell you where that limit for you may be, but it's something to play around with and, and test out. And so that's why I say you go your attention as far out as you can and as, as in as you can, as comfortable as it can be. And this is one of those things that I think is a good practice to do when you are feeling good um as part of maybe a mindfulness routine because you're you're not judging you are just sort of paying attention to what's happening how you're feeling right um <clears throat> and the next two thoughts kind of go together um there's a concept called radical acceptance which is from dbt it's sort of the ability to accept situations that are out of your control but not judging them so it's raining i hate rain right that's not radical acceptance it's raining 
and you're still acknowledging how you're feeling, your emotions. You're not denying, you're not avoiding, you're not ignoring the situation. Doesn't mean that you approve of what's happening, which I think is relevant for this moment. It is naming the emotion, naming how you're feeling, acknowledging that this is where you're at. Like things are bad and I feel bad. No judgment about either of those. Like you are allowed to feel the things that you're feeling. Um, and the other side of radical acceptance is a concept called radical compassion. Um, it's by somebody, um, her name is Tara Bratch. She actually has a lot of resources on her website, um, meditations and um, like different kinds of like recordings and just skills. And, and she does a lot of really, really good like self-compassion work and mindfulness work. Um, you know, like, so she's a good resource. So for radical compassion, um, the way that we look at it is the, the acronym RAIN. So you recognize what's happening, allow the experience to be there just as it is. You're not trying to change. You're not trying to, you know, do anything. But you are trying to investigate, like, what is happening? Like, I'm curious. Like, you're approaching it with curiosity versus, like, you know, a judgment. And then you give yourself nurture with self-compassion and, and kindness and love for what it is that you're experiencing and for yourself. Um, and my last slide um, are two resources that I find when I'm not feeling particularly great or I'm not, you know, I'm out of ideas. Um, these two creators kind of have a lot of different like self-compassion and mental health content. Um, it's very cute, it's very colorful. Um, at times I've, you know, I think it'd be very useful to have something that maybe can help you recognize like, you know, look forward to something else. And I'm a big fan of color, so I think their work is really, I found really helpful. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Diana. We will now open the floor for um, questions and comments. So uh, I suggest that we take uh, a few questions and a few comments, and then we'll turn the mic back over to our presenters. So we're looking for questions and comments. Kanya, your mic is open on our end. Yes, um, one thing that came out of this recent election was the way Kamala Harris did address the young people, the Generation Z. She was very particular about just paying attention to them. That was refreshing. And the, my question or comment is based on that. Um, for some of us, like myself, who is in their 70s and working with a Generation Z in our collective, we need uh, some kind of guidance, some skills that uh, you can maybe help us uh, to take note of. Obviously, and I'll be brief now again, that uh, this generation is much more flexible about uh, the mental health condition compared to the dark ages of our time. Uh, so that is both ways. So there are some coping skills. Hopefully you get my question, just a, a question of things to do list for some of us who are coping in uh, dealing with that generation in our collectives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking for other raised hands before we turn the mic back over to our presenters. Gustavo, your mic is open on our end. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, been a long time coming this year in, uh, near Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm happy to see you guys uh, covering such an uh, important topic of mental health, uh, especially for us. Uh, we're such a marginalized uh, political group. And uh, our ideologies are 
basically been uh, uh, tried to be attenuated by the ruling class for so long. And so that has uh, psychological effects of, uh, you know, like uh, isolation type of uh, uh, psychological effects. And, um, you know, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of us right now are dealing with mental health issues because of that isolation. Because uh, I guess uh, the rest of society's structure, like uh, they, they, they have their own churches, like they, they go to church and that's how they, uh, and maybe that's a conduit for their social interaction. And, um, you know, the, the us communists were like ostracized from society for the most part. Uh, and so we have to be uh, uh, active members of our community and be leaders and uh, try to find an alternative to uh, the uh, church-based uh, social system. And uh, we have to be good leaders, like we got to be coaches, we got to be instructors, you know, like maybe karate instructors. We have to uh, insert ourselves into the fabrics of uh, the neighborhood and be leaders in the neighborhood so that younger generations look up to us and they seek knowledge uh, from us. But we also, from them, we, uh, uh, you know, we uh, connect with uh, other people as well. So it's, uh, I think that uh, uh, we are uh, communists, very, very highly intellectual. Uh, and we are, uh, uh, we could be the greatest leaders in the community as the social fabric unfolds, you know, like the, as, as the uh, breaking down of society becomes more and more apparent, we can be uh, there to pick up the pieces. Uh, and then, yeah, that's basically, I think you, you guys covered a, a great topic. I think uh, that, uh, that uh, if you also um, uh, look up uh, psycho, like the, how psychopaths work, I think the ruling class are ruled by we're ruled by psychopaths, uh, the, and so what we have to do is uh, basically learn how they operate and try to not become victims of uh, of the psychopathic ruling class that's ruling us and and they they do have uh, very manipulative uh, very manipulative uh, uh, techniques and uh, they. Okay. Uh, Pray okay. upon us, basically. Okay. Thank you. You good? Uh, I was going to keep on going, but uh, it seems like you don't want me to keep on going. or. Well, it's not what I want. It's time, dear. It's time. We, oh, it's we time. Have... Okay. So, thank you. I think you made uh, a contribution. Thank you. Uh, even though uh, uh, I would uh, suggest we be aware and maybe our presenters will in, in, indicate that we are not opposed to religious people. As a matter of fact, sometimes we understand exactly what it is they're doing. Because uh, sometimes religion, uh, well, the experts indicate that uh, there's a meditative aspect uh, employed in that process. But anyway, looking for uh, other raised hands. So let's be aware that we're not, uh, just because people are religious, they don't become a target for us. Uh, Elizabeth, your mic is open. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm wondering how to like balance this, uh, maintaining like mental health and just health in general between like college and party work and like just hobbies and social maintaining like a social life just how do we find this balance between all these things we need to maintain within our lives okay thank you elizabeth looking for other raised hands before we turn the mic back over looking for other raised hands okay we have another gustavo hi uh no question just a comment want to say great presentations looking forward to hear the answer to the previous question. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for other raised hands. Kalia, your mic is open on, I probably butchered your name. K-A-I-L. Yes, your mic is open. Speak up, please. Hi, 
Hi, it's Kayla, and it's okay. Um, I just want a quick question for Diana. I didn't see the last slide for the resources of other people to check out. If you can just like share that, that'd be really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Peter, we're opening your mic. Uh, hey, just wanted to uh, say thank you for this presentation because um, it was very nice to hear from folks that uh, uh, that you know they've got the same worries that I do. So again, thank you to all the presenters for putting this together. Thank you, Peter. Stefan, your mic is open. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. These were really informative. Um, I just had a question. It's sort of more of a an interpersonal skills type question for uh, being in organizing spaces. Sometimes we interact with people who maybe are not uh, very skilled uh, in interpersonal graces. And I'm just wondering if there are any um, resources, whether like a book or a talk or anything like that, that maybe give some good insight um, specifically for organizers, or if, if not specifically for organizers, that's okay too. Um, but I was just thinking about the other day how there's like you know business people have their how to win, what is it how to win friends and influence people or something like that is there is there something like that for uh, our comrades thank you all right so uh before i turn the mic over to our presenters i just want to highlight one thing that they said we are working to gain greater and greater control over our attention. And I think the presenters, uh, each presenter suggested that we can develop the skill of where we put our attention. We may not be able to control it fully, but instead of ruminating, meaning going over the, the miserable thing over and over and over again, we can choose to put our attention somewhere else. And I underline uh, it. Uh, so even when you're watching the news, you we can choose not to be reactive. We can choose not to over-engage. So just a little tidbit uh, offered. So now we'll go in the order of uh, the presentations. So Jim, you have the mic. Yeah, um, I wanted to address a couple of things. One was um, the question of being engaged in our communities. I think it's really important as communists particularly that we do not see ourselves as separate or as separate from the working class or separate from our communities. We, we do have a particular role to play, but um, it, one of the things that bourgeois society tries to do is to separate communists out as some sort of foreign element. In a different way, unions are often treated that way in the workplace, as if there's the unions and then there's the workers. And a lot of times management addresses them as if they were separate. Um, I think what Dee said about religion is very important because we have had a history of really um, dedicated working class and working class leaders and, and heroic people and people who have fought for equality. Um, some of whom I was very fortunate to meet, some of whom I wasn't, but people like Mother Jones, um, I certainly didn't meet, it was before my time. Um, Daniel Berrigan, I did meet. Um, there, were, there are people who have been, one of the things that churches can do is provide a community that people can meet in and can work together in. And sure, for some people it can be a, an escapist kind of thing about like, I'm not gonna do anything about this world because I'm gonna, I'm waiting for the next world. But there are, that has not been, if you look at the history of, for example, the poor people's movement right now, Reverend William Barber and Liz Theo Harris, um, 
Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, we can go through our history. Churches have played a very important role and there's no contradiction between being a communist and participating in communities, whether they be churches, labor unions are very common communities that um, come together to do these kinds of things. You know, there are cultural um, activities, sports activities. Um, there's any number of ways that people can get together with other people, in, including things that we can do as a party. And we need to be sure that our club life and that our party life is not just always, you know, talking about the intellectual aspects of Marxism. Culture has been a very important part of our history and something that we have brought into the American people's history and have, have contributed to that oftentimes we don't get credit for, but that um, is really important. So I, I think whatever ways that we can find to be connected with other people in our neighborhoods, in our communities, um, in our churches, in our workplaces, we should do, and we should not see ourselves as kind of special, separate people because it's damaging to us as politically and it's damaging to us psychologically. I wanted to say something about the balancing issue. It's really important that as part of collectives, we recognize that none of us as individuals is responsible for the entire class struggle. That's it's antithetical to what the class struggle is and to what we are about. And it's one of the things that the capitalist class tries to impose upon us is a belief and a feeling that any time that is not quote unquote productive is wasted or is bad which makes rest a waste, it makes taking care of yourself a waste, it makes having fun with your friends or participating in non-profitable activities a waste. We need to be careful because I think sometimes it seeps into our movements. The belief that if I need to, if I want to take a weekend off, to celebrate my birthday or to go and, and celebrate my anniversary with my partner or my spouse or whatever it may be, that somehow I'm letting the movement down or I'm letting the world down because I really shouldn't be doing that. It's, um, that is, I think, really falling into a bourgeois trap. And the, the, what the bourgeoisie really would love is for all of us to be exhausted and, and just um, constantly spinning our wheels. So trying to figure out a way to do our part in the collective, to give what is ours to give, and to allow other people to do the same thing, I think is a really important part of what we all need to do as union members, as church members, as family members, and as communists. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and I'd like to remind us that uh, the party does have a uh, religious commission. Um, all right, uh, next is Richard. You can open your mic. Okay, um, really well said, Jim. I don't have a whole lot to add other than uh, in terms of the book recommendation. Oh, I'm sorry, I should be holding this closer. Uh, um, in terms of the book recommendation, I, I don't have anything specific, though I would encourage you to read even the things that you think are marketed towards um, people who are antithetical to our class, because if, if there are useful things there, um, there's no reason that we can't also use those tools for ourselves. Thank you, Richard. And uh, Diana. Um, so I, for the question of like Gen Z and kind of how to work with them, I will say, I think talking to them and asking them and being authentic and being able to listen to them and, you know, like working on actually forming connections with them and also some of the like emotional regulation stuff that we've talked about will help. Um, I don't know if that was exactly the, your question, but hopefully this helps. Um, for how to balance it all, the truth is you can't and i don't think that that's 
a realistic goal to set that you're going to be able to balance all of these things all at the same time. You won't. Sometimes you can't do your best. You just have to do whatever it is that is the bare minimum. Sometimes that means that you have to focus on you or school or something else or your family or work. Sometimes things need to take priority. And that doesn't mean that you're failing. We are living in a system that is requiring you to give more time and energy than any of us have. So don't try to balance it all. Try to focus on what you can do and when you need to rest, rest. And that doesn't just mean sleep. It it means spending time with your loved ones, spending time with yourself, spending time taking care of yourself. So um, I know that's not, you know, the perfect answer, but hopefully that kind of helps. Um, for the books and resources for kind of how to talk to people that maybe are not, you know, don't have the, the best interpersonal skills, I don't know that there is one, one resource over another. I would say um, that anything geared towards, like, um, trauma-informed resources or things maybe towards like a through a neurodivergent lens can help because those resources tend to be very um, geared towards people that are emotionally reactive. Um, There is um, an author, her name is Dr. Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, and she writes a blog at Neurodivergent Insights. And so she talks a lot about autism and ADHD and not that I'm saying that people you're working with have either of those things but I do find that the way that she presents how to deal with emotions is useful for most people um there is also a book about parents with emotional immaturity um and it's adult children of emotionally immature parents by Lindsay Gibson um and she talks a lot about what it's like to grow up with parents that are emotionally mature and how to set boundaries with them. So something like that could be useful. Um, and also there's an author, her name is Nadra Tawab Glover. She talks a lot about boundaries. She also has an Instagram. Um, and I find that she has helped me to see how to frame things and also not how to, like if I have to set a boundary, not to expect to feel good about it because sometimes you won't. And so you're kind of balancing how you deal with things and also how to talk to other people, if that makes sense. So hopefully those um, resources will help you. Thank you very much to our panelists uh, tonight, Richard, Diana, Jim. Good night, everyone. And thank you very much.